Professor Berecho, thank you very much for your agreement to make this interview and our conversation will be about connection between theology and philosophy. I know that it's a huge theme, so that's why I'd like to uh, concentrate uh, on this theme in the context of uh, books of St. Fathers. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know that you study ancient philosophy and also you study uh, the books of St. Fathers. And uh, in this context, I'd like to discuss with you some problems, some questions that we can find in the books on ancient authors and also in the books of St. Fathers. And the first theme uh, is uh, freedom, mm -hmm. freedom of a man. Uh, what ancient authors think about man's freedom and how this uh, theme um, was transformated by St. Fathers in their books? Well, I think the Fathers uh, go well beyond what the ancient philosophers say about freedom because uh, for the ancient Greek philosophers, they tend to think of God as an impersonal first principle. For Plato, it's uh, the form of the good and the demiurge. Uh, he, you know, in different dialogues, he talks about both of those. For Aristotle, it's the prime mover. For the Stoics, it's the logos. But none of those are a personal God who has a will for us, who gives us commands, who invites us to, to know him in a kind of a face-to-face -face relationship. Um, and because they have no definite belief about divine freedom, I think they also have no definite belief about human freedom. It's, it's left vague. That's not to, they're not determinists either. They don't believe in physical determinism. But, uh, you know, for instance, Plato in the, book of, in the Republic, in the myth of air at the end of the book, in book 10, um, he describes how each soul is brought up uh, to a place between their earthly lives and then they make a choice of the next life they will live. And everything within that life is more or less determined by the choice they make in this celestial place. Uh, but it's a myth and it's hard to tell how much he believes in this freedom to choose and, and even if it is a real freedom, it's only between our lives, it's not within each life. Um, so they leave a lot of things unclear. I think the fathers, because they believe in a personal God uh, who creates the world out of love and creates us in order that we may love him in return, um, they understand that freedom exists in God and therefore also in us. Uh, God could have done differently. He didn't have to make the world. Um, and we have choice as well because we choose either the good or the evil. And so uh, you find early on, you know, in the Greek apologists like St. Justin Martyr, uh, Tatian and others, um, they reject the determinism of the ancient world that they found among the Gnostics, among the Manichaeans. Also, even popular belief in astrology was deterministic. And they reject that and they say, no, we do have freedom. And we must have freedom because that's how God created us to be, uh, to love him with freedom. Uh, so, thank you. And um, the next question is in connection with the first. Um, some ancient authors, for example, Plato, uh, spoke about body, about flesh, like about a prison for soul. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, the position of Jews in Old Testament is principally another. How can you comment what uh, uh, the position of St. Fathers mm -hmm. is closer to the tradition of Old Testament or the tradition of ancient authors, if we speak about uh, flesh, body, and uh, its connection with the soul? Well, it's a large subject because even in Plato, he'll say different things in different places. Um, in the Phaedo, he does talk about how we need to uh, release the soul from the body. And the body, the soul can only know things truly when it's separate from the body. Philosophy is a practice for death, which is separation of the soul from the body. The Cratylus, he says, he uses this analogy that the, the body is a tomb, the soma is a sema. But uh, other dialogues like the uh, Phaedrus, you have the charioteer myth, 
and the soul has fallen to earth and it acquired a body and now it has to use that body rightly and properly and learn to love in the right way uh, in order to re regrow its wings. And so it's uh, through the use we make of the body. Uh, also in the symposium, in the ladder of love, I think there's something similar. So he has two sides, uh, all, even in his thought about the body, one more negative, one more positive. Um, I think his philosophy as a whole, when you think about the forms and the relation of form and bodily things, uh, bodily things are images, they're icons of the forms. And that's what the fathers found very fruitful, was to follow up that line of thought, that uh, this sensible world is an image uh, or an icon of the heavenly reality. You find that in the New Testament talking about worship, for instance, in Hebrews, that the worship of the temple is an image of the celestial worship. And we, we believe this in the liturgy, right? That our worship is partaking of the heavenly worship. And so they, they think of human life in, the, in this world uh, in those terms as a kind of an image of something that is higher. And we have to live within it and take it seriously as it is for us now. But it's not the highest reality. There's something far beyond. And it's only by living rightly within the body that God gives us that we can, uh, like in, in Plato, we can regrow our wings, you might say, and, and return uh, to our real home. Maybe it's my mistake, but uh, sometimes I think that um, our idea, our understanding of uh, human's death is closer to Plato's thinking about uh, the connection between body and the soul. And uh, because, of, as Father George Falerowski said in one of his articles, that um, modern Orthodox Christians uh, think about death, human's death, like about a freedom, freedom of the soul from the problems of this world and problems of this body. Uh, but for a biblical understanding of the death, death is like a tragedy because uh, man starts to live in a normal situation because a uh, real man is a man uh, with body and soul in their close connection. Yes. Am I agree in this? Uh, well, yes. I mean, for so for us yeah. as Christians, uh, death is we pray for rest, right? Mm -hmm. Give rest to thy servant. Um, but um, that doesn't mean um, sleep. You know, it's not it's not just total unawareness because we also believe that the the dead hear our prayers. We can pray to the departed saints and they intercede for us. So the soul continues to exist uh, in some form within God's mercy, but it's always, it's still a kind of a halfway exist. You know, it's not full until the resurrection of the body. And it's only when the body is resurrected and then we're brought up again that, that we're really ourselves holy again in order to be with, with God. Um, that's at least as I understand it. The theme of body is in connection with the theme of male and female. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, all we know that uh, the understanding of male and female in Russia, in Russian tradition and in Western tradition, um, there is a huge difference between these positions. Mm -hmm. uh, what is a biblical uh, understanding of male and female, and uh, what is the understanding in uh, the books of ancient authors found to them? Well, you know, so I think the male and female for the ancient philosophers mm -hmm. is a little like human freedom. Um, they leave it a little vague, and uh, at least in some places, Plato in the Republic, for instance, he talks about, well, we'll have the women exercise with the men and be, do the same things as the men, and then we'll make a choice which ones are ready to be educated to be guardians. And so it's very egalitarian, and, and some feminists today love these passages. Um, I'm not sure Plato believed that because other places he says other things. But they have no conviction, as, as Christians do, that God, that man was created 
to be male and female. Uh, when you, you know, when you read Genesis, then um, God created man in his image, male and female. That's already there in Genesis 1. And of course, Genesis 2, Eve is taken from the side of Adam. And I think there's something very profound that God can only make man in his image by making the two who are different who need each other. Um, there's a complementarity, a kind of a mutual respect, a mutual relation, a mutual love. <clears throat> and this is new for, uh, in Christian thought. I don't think the ancient Greeks had this idea because they didn't have Genesis, they didn't have uh, the understanding of God as creator. Nowadays, we live in a world of separated sciences. There are very special sciences, biology, geography, and other, other. Uh, but in the Middle Ages, uh, science was only one science, theology, and uh, there were some subject that, subjects that were connected with theology. Uh, how our world can uh, find this situation, the situation of uh, one science, um, global thinking about this world and a man. Do you mean how can we overcome the, all the mm -hmm. divisions that, well, I think um, these divisions mainly came about in the scientific revolution of the 17th century. Uh, up till then, yes, what we call science was natural philosophy, and it was a branch of philosophy um, integrated with the whole. In the scientific revolution, people began to think of nature uh, separately from God as a separate autonomous system that has its own laws. And of course, uh, some scientists were still Christians, but many were not. They thought that nature simply run, runs on its own. And so um, what we need is to recover the awareness that nature uh, is not only made by God, it manifests God. Everything that occurs within nature is that way because it shows divine wisdom in some way. And of course, this is the teaching of the fathers. They talk about natural contemplation, theoria physicae, uh, where the saints can see the divine logoi within nature. Um, and so I think uh, modern science has done some good things, many good things, and some of them help us to recover this. We, we see how um, in cosmology, the, the very laws of nature seem like they're created to enable life, for example, uh, and other ways too, that I think science itself over time is going to help, help us to recover that sense. And uh, the last question is a global question about philosophy and theology. Ancient uh, philosophers, their books were used by Saint Fathers to explain to explain details of uh, Christian theology. So Christian theology was made at the fundament of uh, ancient authors. Nowadays, we have too many philosophical schools, mm -hmm. uh, too many philosophical divisions. Some of them are very popular, some not, but in this world, in our time, we understand that a church can also use, um, use some things from uh, philosophy to explain better our people what is Christianity, what is theology. In ancient times, this experience of using philosophy wasn't uh, always very successful. We can uh, remember, for example, origin. Mm -hmm. But uh, also was it successful, like Father, Father St. Basil the Great and others. If we would try to use this experience of ancient times, what mistakes should we avoid in using philosophy in our uh, theological method or uh, other uh, things yeah. of theology? Well, the mistake is always to think that philosophy can uh, figure things out on its own. Mm -hmm. And so any philosophical system, if you take it as a conclusive whole uh, and simply use it, you, there will be mistakes and you'll, you'll fall into the same errors they've committed. Um, 
I think the right way to think about philosophy is the way some of the fathers did. You know, Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trifo, the, the dialogue with the Jew, uh, the first eight chapters or so, he describes how he tried the different schools of ancient philosophy and found that none of them brought him closer to God. They had some good things, but even when they had good teachings, they didn't enable him, give him the strength he needed to practice those teachings. And only when he learned Christianity did he conclude this is the true philosophy. This is the, what enables me to do the things I wanted to do before and I couldn't. Uh, to know God, to know God as that which is good, that which is highest. Um, and that's how we should think of philosophy. They're all trying in their ways, their different ways, to find the truth and that which is highest. And some come closer, some less. None of them have the power of the gospel. Uh, so we can use their language sometimes, sometimes their ideas to articulate those strivings of the human heart. But none of them are a substitute for only Christ can actually bring you to the Father. Um, and, and philosophers, when they're honest, they'll admit this. They'll admit this is just ideas, this is not what you need to live. Uh, all Christianity gives what, what you need to live. Thank you. Thank you very much for this conversation. Oh, you're welcome, Father.